Good morning. Thank you for letting me be here with you. Um, as Andy said, you know, my name is Greg Gifford. I have the privilege of knowing you guys through Bob Somerville. And uh, just to put myself in further context, I am a pastor at Bob Somerville's church. So technically, I'm his spiritual leader. It's a scary thing. <laughs> I do whatever he tells me to tell him to do. So it's, it's good to be here. Uh, it's also good to see how you guys are creatively worshiping. Uh, we are also meeting outside, and hopefully this encourages your soul. Uh, we've been doing that since May, and uh, we're trying to be creative with you. We're trying to be creative with weather and so forth. And so it's, it is an important thing for us to gather together, and I think we've learned that through this time. And so I, I appreciate what your church leaders are doing to create creative options for you, for those that are streaming this now. Uh, the Lord is he's stretching us a little bit, isn't he? And yet we see that God's using this to really strengthen his church and help us be creative and love each other and defer to each other. So it's, it's good for me to see that. Hopefully it's good for you guys to hear that you have another church in Santa Clarita that's on the patio this morning. And we're uh, doing our best to love each other in unique times. I also want you to know that um, if you don't mind, at this time, I'd, I'd like you to grab your Bible and let's open up and let's go to Acts chapter 15. We're going to be in Acts 15 to start with this morning. As you're turning there, uh, Dr. Somerville was just giving me a little context about your church and about some of the next steps of John coming back soon. Uh, it's extraordinarily important that you guys gave him that time to be able to go on sabbatical. And I hope you see that, that that's part of your investment into your pastor and his longevity. Uh, that he can effectively minister here as he's done in other churches and, and help this congregation since 2014. So we're, I just want to encourage you in that. That's a super wise move on your behalf. Uh, we're thankful, Dr. Bob and I, speaking of us, we're thankful for the work that you guys are doing there. He's also just said how you guys, you're becoming your own church, your own independent church. You're in the process of uh, forming leadership teams and those who will be the the next generation of this church. And so I, I wanted to share just a little bit from the word today about who is a, a truly wise and uh, who are the truly qualified. James is going to ask it in this way. Who are the experts? Who are the ones that we should be looking to for teaching? We'll see that here in a second. But before we get to James, I want to tell you a little bit about the Jerusalem council Jerusalem Council is what's happening in Acts 15 and at the end of Acts 14. It was actually a council that was predicated by a lot of controversy. The controversy wasn't so much about what was happening in Jerusalem. It was more about what was happening abroad. At the end of chapter 14, you'll see that what took place is there was a disagreement. And the disagreement was it's going to be on, on what do we tell the the disciples, the Gentiles, what do we tell them that they are to do? And at the beginning of chapter 15, the command in verse 1 was that this is what we're telling the Gentiles to do, that unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. Read verse 2 with me as well. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others who were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. What had taken place is that there was such a disagreement about that statement that Paul and Barnabas were, they were sent from Northern Antioch down to Jerusalem because they needed to get resolution over such a divisive topic. That the topic was separating those that were dear. That there were those that authentically loved and wanted to honor the law and not abolish it, but there were those that were fighting that justification can only come through Christ. That there is no work of the law that can add to that. In an important time of the early church, they were seeking to guide newly converted Gentiles, helping the newly converted Gentiles figure out how do they balance the law and how do they not balance the law? How do they overemphasize the law? How do you denigrate from salvation by faith in Jesus alone? Apparently, it was so contentious that they needed help. They needed third party. 
they needed the wisdom of the church at Jerusalem to help speak into this issue. If you could imagine that you're disagreeing with a group of friends and yet you need somebody to help provide discernment, wisdom, and direction for the next best steps, that's where the apostles and that's where the early church is finding itself here in Acts 15. So they go to Jerusalem. Look in verse 7 with me. And they were there after much debate. Peter stood up and he said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. If you remember Cornelius... Peter begins to remind them of what we read about in Acts 10, that God saved those that were Gentiles and that God sent his spirit among the Gentiles and that God is, he is not partial. Go down to verse 12. As the assembly fell silent, they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied. What's interesting is that you have at the Jerusalem council that first of all, there's a recount of what's taking place that people are going through. This is how God has worked among the Gentiles. We were there. We were part of that. We saw what God did. God is not a respecter of persons, that he is saving all, including those who are Jewish and Gentile. At a time when dissension could have mounted, when divisiveness was just waiting beneath the surface, when disagreement and the Christian church north and the Christian church south could have developed, a man rises up to speak. That's what we see in verse 13. That this man was James. Here's what we know about James up to this point. That he was said to be a pillar of the church at Jerusalem. Think of, think of the importance of that. That James was most likely the same James that Paul says in Galatians 2, that he is a pillar of the church, that that James is the same James that we're reading about here and the same James that will write the words that we will see here in a few minutes in James chapter 3. That James was the half-brother of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 7 says that after Jesus had resurrected, that he revealed himself to his half-brother, James. And that at that point, James began to be a follower of his own brother, Jesus Christ. That James began to take leadership in the church at Jerusalem. And in the church at Jerusalem, he began to rise in the ranks, so to speak. Rising all the way to the point of being a pillar, Galatians 2.9. Look in verse 13 of Acts 15. He says this. And after they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. What takes place is that James stands up and that he reminds them of scriptural truth. That James was a leader of leaders and he rises among those leaders. He rises among those impassioned missionaries. He rises among those and says, those who are on the field doing the work, listen, that this is a fulfillment of what God has forecasted all along. Now, verse 19, my judgment is this, that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality, from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Last verse in Acts 15. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. That what they heard from James, they liked. 
that James stands up in the middle of a potential controversial time and James offers wisdom. He takes God's word and he appropriates it to the circumstance. If you've ever been in a context where you, you know that we're all peers, that there's not a singular authority, you know that at times it's hard to lead in that context. You have to earn it. You have to be respected. You have to be looked to. You have to be trusted. James demonstrates that. What he says shapes the counsel that would be given to newly conver converted Gentiles. That's us. Newly converted Gentiles. We are the converted Gentiles, by the way. That what he was preparing to say would forever shape the way that you received the Mosaic Law. The emphasis that was put on the Mosaic Law. That the Jerusalem Council... These words were penned just a few words, just a few years. Go with me to James 3. Just a few years after what we're going to read in James 3. Most likely, there was a three-year difference between James chapter 3, verse 17, verse 13, verse 14, what we're going to read here in a moment there was a three or four year difference between when James wrote these words and when he stood up at a central time, a pivotal time in the early church and offered wisdom, wisdom that would shape the early converts. So go with me to James chapter three. If you're there, I just want to highlight verse one and then we'll go down to verse 13. Verse 1, it seems like James is writing to people who are looking for leadership positions. They're looking to be the Bible teacher because he says in verse 1, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. What a sobering call to teach the Word of God brings with it greater judgment. Ah! If I wasn't nervous enough already, and now I'm even more nervous about the way that God will give an account for how I teach this word this morning. He's speaking to those that are considering themselves as the expert. Go to verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James was writing to a group of individuals who are most likely Jewish Christians. This is the earliest New Testament letter that we own. That it was happening just years apart from the, the council that we read at Jerusalem. And James is writing to those that are seeking to be in authoritative positions. Verse 1, not many of you should become teachers. Verse 13, who is wise and who's understanding? The James is wanting to clarify that the way that we measure wisdom and the way that that the Bible measures wisdom, that God measures wisdom is often antithetical. This book is packed full with wisdom that really we could say the central themes of James are faith and wisdom. James chapter one, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach. This theme of wisdom permeates the book and now James is going to apply it to those that are moving towards leadership. If you really do think that you are wise and you really do think that you are understanding, well, here's what we have to be cognizant of. What's interesting is that James likes to ask questions. You'll see this all throughout his book. If you have your Bible, look in chapter 2, verse 5. Listen, my brothers, has God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? 
which he's promised to those who love him? In the context of partiality, didn't God choose from everybody? So why would you be partial? Chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he doesn't have works? Can that faith save him? No. No. He goes on to describe how you must have a faith that works. Chapter 3, verse 11. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? James loves this style of prompting us through the questions that he asks. Have you ever been asked such a good question that it just cuts you right to the bone? It's just precise. It's incisive. You're asked such a question that they didn't need to tell you anything. All they had to do is ask you that question. James does that repeatedly. Some of the weightier questions that he asks at the beginning of chapter 4, he says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Ah, that one's too close, James. Chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Is anyone cheerful? Is anyone among you sick? Chapter 5, verse 14. This rhetorical question is part of James's intention and in, in teaching us that we as recipients of this letter can learn through the questions that James is asking. And in verse 13, he asks that question, who is wise and who is understanding among you? When we say understanding, perhaps you think of that really discerning person in your life. Maybe you think of that person that you can bring any question, they're able to synthesize it for you. But this, this word understanding could also be translated as learned or as skilled, as apt or an expert. If I say understanding, you may miss the flow that, that James is actually saying, who's the expert among you guys? Who's the learned one? Who's the apt one? Who's the skillful one? Now, if I just asked you that question in November of 2020, what's your immediate response? Maybe we go to certifications, education. I'm a professor. You know, my mind defaults to education when we think of qualifications. Maybe we think of some life experience. You've done this. You've lived abroad. You've studied abroad. Maybe we think of accumulation that you'll know once you've owned your own home. When I say who is the expert to you, that's what James is getting at here who are the wise, who are the experts among you. And yet the way that he answers it is unique. Look at the last part of verse 13. By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. It is your good conduct that demonstrates that you are wise and you are skillful, that you are the expert. It is your conduct that should permeate and overflow into meekness or humility. The truly wise and the truly learned person isn't the person that tells you they're the truly wise and truly learned person. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? Trust me, trust me. Trust me, I'm the expert here. The truly wise and learned person isn't the person that knows the most amount of information. That possesses the most amount of certifications or degrees. The truly wise and learned person is the person that demonstrates their qualifications in their good and godly conduct. Let me tell you of a, a quick story. I had the privilege of serving in the United States Army for four years active duty. It's one of the highlights of my life. I've enjoyed that. I got out in 2012. I'm very thankful. I got to serve stateside. I got to serve abroad. I was primarily stationed in Korea where I served on the DMZ. Uh, if you're familiar with Panmunjom, I got to spend one year and nine blessed months in the middle of nowhere on the Korean DMZ. One of the things that we did in the military is that we had trainings that we were always attending. 
One of the first trainings I attended was called Basic Officer Leader Course. It's a course where they put all the newly commissioned officers together in the military. That no matter your background, if you came from West Point or you came from Officer Candidate School or you did ROTC, whatever you came from, you were funneled into this one class. What took place is that in that class, we had those that were former Special Forces soldiers. Special Forces are the elite of the military, if you're unaware. The, the Green Berets, they are the best. They're the Special Ops. We all knew that they were Green beret, Berets, excuse me, not because of they walking around bragging about their accomplishments. They were actually two very quiet men that they didn't walk around and tell us that they were Green Berets, but every time we entered into a range or someone had to lead a mission or that we would actually fight in mixed martial arts, and trust me, we were all scared to get matched up with these two guys. Please, Lord, not us. Send someone else. It is not I. They were the best. They were the best. They didn't have to tell you they were the best. In fact, they didn't tell you they were the best. But whenever it came time for them to lead, they were the best leaders. When it came time for them to shoot, they were the best shooters. When it came time for them to engage in mixed martial arts, they were the best. They demonstrated that they were elite in their conduct, not in their words. They didn't have to tell you that they were elite. You knew it. You witnessed it in the same way that I could witness the eliteness of these soldiers. James is saying that those that are truly wise and truly learned, if you're really the expert, one of the things that you must feel on your life is the call to do more before you say more. To do more before you say more. Let your conduct and your actions demonstrate your wisdom. Let it demonstrate your learnedness. It seems as if James is addressing those who think that they're wise and they're experts, that they're wanting to assert themselves as the teacher and the spiritual authority. And James is saying, don't start with your words, start with your conduct. Let your conduct be that which vindicates and ratifies your wisdom. Do more before you say more. Go back to verse 14. Look in verse 14 with me. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. If you're reading from the English Standard Version, it makes this sentence just a little bit awkward. To boast and be false to the truth is translated literally as to lie against the truth, to lie against the truth. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, you are lying against the truth. You are not the wise and learned person. That's not truthful. That person's wisdom isn't from above. That's an earthly wisdom that we'll read about again. James is saying that what's, what's noteworthy here that James is saying is that at the source of these jealousies, and these selfish ambitions, that they come from your heart. Did you catch the last part of, of this first clause? But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, if you understand the heart biblically, recognize that that is an infection at the core of your being, selfish ambition and jealousy. He did not say, if you do selfish things, or you have jealous actions that you take. But if, if this level of selfishness and bitterness infects the center of your existence, your heart, then just wait. That will overflow into your actions. For those of you that are familiar with the biblical teaching of the heart, the Bible describes our heart as being the fountain or the source of the things that we do. Jesus says, if you have a pure heart, you'll see God. He also says that your heart's like a tree. It brings good fruit or bad fruit. Proverbs 4 describes it like a well. 
that your heart is a well and from it flow the issues of life. Proverbs 4, 23. So if you have bitterness and selfishness in your heart, just give it time. If you harbor it and you haven't acted on it, just give it time. It will come out in your actions. Selfishness never stays in our hearts. Bitter jealousy never stays in our hearts. It always overflows. It becomes the mood, the word, the action. James is saying in verse 14, if that's happening in your heart, don't lie against the truth. Don't deceive yourself. That that is not wisdom from above, that that is wisdom from below. Keep going with me. Go back to the text here. This is verse 15. These are very strong words. He says in verse 15, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly. It's unspiritual. It's demonic. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. This is wisdom from below. This is not something that God has endowed. This is earthly. This is even potentially satanic. Very matter-of-factly, James states that the actions of a divisive person confirm that they are not a person who is wise, that they're a person who is wise from this world. And the wisdom of this world stands in contrast to the wisdom from above. Earthly wisdom is typified in its isolation from the things of God. Yet the believer is called to set their mind on things above. We just read this passage a few minutes ago, Colossians chapter 3. Or perhaps you could read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where Paul says, I don't put my eyes on the things that are temporal, but on the things that are eternal. The believer is called to look to what they can't see with the eyes of faith. But if we have resentful selfishness or jealousy, we're not looking to the things we can't see with the eyes of faith. We're demonstrating that we have a wisdom of this world. And he describes it in such a scary manner. Not only does he say that you're, you're being false to the truth, But here's what happens in verse 16. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Every vile practice is an outworking of what starts in your heart. That potentially, when I say, it's okay for me to be selfish and bitter at the level of my heart, What I've just swung open the door for is disorder and every vile practice. Disorder is simply unruliness. You could say opposition to authority. Maybe you buck the system. That whenever I harbor bitter jealousy at the level of my heart, it flings open the door for me to be anti-authoritarian, for me to buck the system, for unruliness and opposition to established authorities. And now I have a substandard morality, a, a vile practice. Where did all of that start? It started in my heart. So that's not the, that's not the wise person. When you look at that life and you see divisiveness, when you see a lack of peace, When you look at that life and you see disorder and a lack of morality, you don't see the truly expert. You don't see the apt. You don't see the wise. You see a person that possesses a wisdom that is satanic. It's of this world. Yet, James doesn't stay there. He helps us to know who is the wise. What is wisdom? Let's keep going. Look at verse 17. Here it is. But wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. It's gentle. It's open to reason. It's full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. 
and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This wisdom from above in verse 17. That first of all, this is, this is the source of it. This is the location of where you get true wisdom. That it is from above. That God himself is the one that endows wisdom to us. Just remember in chapter 1, verse 5, I read it a few minutes ago. The James says that God is the one that gives wisdom to those that ask it. When you're in a trial, when you're being tossed to and fro, ask wisdom and ask it from God, and God is the one that endows with wisdom. James understood the character of God really well. God is a wise God. One of the attributes of God is his wisdom. His wisdom simply means that God chooses the best goals and the best means to those goals. That Romans 16, 7 declares that God is the only wise God. There is only one wise God. Would you grab your Bibles? Would you turn with me to Daniel? We'll come back to James. Let's go to Daniel. If you get there before me, go to chapter 2. James is communicating the wisdom of God. And that if we want to truly be wise, we must know this God and we must seek this wisdom from God. Daniel 2, let's start in verse 20. Just by way of context, what takes place is that Daniel and his friends, they're in danger. If they can't discern what this dream will be, then potentially a death sentence awaits them. And as Daniel is receiving now the interpretation of the dream from God, he breaks out into praise. He says in verse 20, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. Here it is. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what it is. Excuse me. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's manner. For Daniel, this was life and death, that the wisdom of God saved him. Blessed be the name of God, to whom belong wisdom. He gives wisdom, verse 21. And verse 23, he has given wisdom to preserve. Daniel acknowledges that God, the same God that James speaks of, is the truly wise God. He is the liberator. He is the one that brings true wisdom. This wise God is the source of wisdom. That when we seek wisdom, we must engage in this wise God. And as we do so, we reflect him. We reflect back the wisdom of God the more we get to know the wisdom of this God. The more you behold the wisdom of God, the more you become like that wisdom. That you become the truly apt, the wise, and the understanding one. Let's go back to James 3. What is that wisdom like? What is that wisdom like? Well, it's like this, verse 17. It's pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's open to reason. It's full of mercy and good fruits. It's impartial. It's sincere. It sows a harvest of righteousness, you see here. At verse 18, it stands in contrast to the wisdom from below. Instead of being contentious and divisive, self-promoting, wisdom from above seeks to live a pure life that results in peace instead of disorder, 
and vile practice? Do you want to know who's the really wise person? Who's the learned? Who's the expert? Who should be the leader, the Bible teacher? Look at the conduct of their life. One commentator said, like true faith, true wisdom is identified by the quality of life that it produces. It's the fruit. It's the harvest. Let me just highlight a couple of the aspects. It's like we're looking at a diamond and just observing different facets of the diamond. Wisdom from above is pure. It's holy. It's morally clean. It's not vile. It's peaceable. It promotes harmony. Does that describe you? Do you promote harmony? If we were to look at your long-term relationships, are you cultivating peace in them? It's gentle. It's courteous. It's gracious. It's forbearing. It's open to reason. I love this one. This one's good for us to hear. True wisdom is open to reason. What does that mean? It means that you're teachable. It means you're teachable. A wise person doesn't know the most. Remember I said that earlier? The wise person doesn't know the most information. They're a teachable person. When you meet with somebody that has wisdom from this earth, they're not teachable. They're not willing to listen. Close ears. No understanding. And yet this idea of being open to reason is that you are, you're willing to yield to the truth. You're teachable. You're full of mercy and good fruits. Literally overflowing. You're stuffed with them. It's obvious. You're impartial. There's no divisiveness. There's no judgmentalism. James 2 James actually rebukes those that are partial because he says it's not about the value of that person. It's about God. God is not a partial God. You're not being like God when you're partial. Wisdom from above is impartial. It's not a respecter of the rich. It's not a respecter of a certain demographic. It is impartial. Wisdom from above is sincere. There's no pretense. There's no hypocrisy. When we look at this wisdom from above, it's genuine and authentic. Doesn't that sound nice to you? To genuinely be impartial, to genuinely be gentle, to genuinely be peaceable and open to truth, that that's just part of who you are. It comes natural to you that God has changed you in such a way that that's the way that you live your life. These are the characteristics of a wise person. Some have connected them to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Galatians 5 reminds us that if you are a Christian, that you will have the Spirit of God indwelling you. And in verse 22 and 23, that there are different aspects of that fruit. That when, when you see the Spirit indwell a person, that they will change. They will look different. They will live their life differently. They will be gentle, wise, loving, peaceable, pure. That some have argued that what James is saying here is similar to that of Paul in Galatians 5. Although we don't have Paul's works until later on, what we do understand is that both of these would be characteristics of true Christian, wise faith. So... What does it look like to be a, a truly wise person? Verse 17 tells us that. Now, I asked you that earlier in the sermon. I asked you, who is the wise and who's the expert? Where does your mind go? Does it go towards credentials? Does it go towards accomplishments? Does it go towards degrees? James woos us into seeing that True wisdom and expertise is demonstrated in godly conduct that is gentle, it's peaceable, it's authentic, it's true. But look at verse 18. I love this. It's somewhat hard to catch as you're reading it. 
English is my first language, and this verse is still difficult for me as I read this. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What's James getting at? A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. If you've ever been on a boat, you can look behind the boat and you can observe the wake of that boat. If you've ever been skiing or wakeboarding, you've experienced that's part of the the fun is catching the wake behind the boat and certain boats are intended to have certain wakes. When you look behind the person who is truly wise, When you look at the wake of their life, you know what you see? You see peace. You see righteousness. It's not divisiveness. It's not destructive relationships and burn bridges. It's not disunity at every relational sphere of their life. When you look behind the person that is truly wise, you see righteousness in their wake. So when James says, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace, that it is those who are truly wise that reap the benefits of living a peaceable life. That's what it looks like to be a peacemaker. We're not talking about during the month of November or the month of December that we're talking about your life is characterized by such wisdom that we can look to the relationships that you have and think, wow, that's beautiful. What a sweet blessing from the Lord. That you get to experience peace. So let me try to pull a couple of things together. I always appreciate when someone synthesizes, distills things down and gives me a couple of key takeaways. I want you to see a couple of key takeaways First of all, from verse 13, that we're to do more before we say more. Do more before you say more. We are in such a tumultuous time within our country. It's such an unusual season that we have opinions, we have preferences, we have convictions. And yet, how do we demonstrate that we are truly wise and learned? It's not by being the loudest. It's not by being the most repetitive. That we demonstrate our wisdom in an uncertain season through our conduct. And that as you demonstrate that wisdom through your conduct, you will earn a voice that individuals will want to hear what it is that you have to say. James would guide us not to be opinionated, not to be verbose in our preferences, but that if you really do want to demonstrate that you are wise and should be listened to, you are an expert, that you bring clout and authority, that you demonstrate it in your actions. And he says, in the meekness of humility, you demonstrate your wisdom in good works. That's partly why godly leadership is often antithetical to worldly leadership. Because the godly leader is typically not the loudest. They're typically not the most assertive. They're typically not the most opinionated. They're typically the one that's open to listening. They're the one that you can look in their life and see a plethora of peace and righteousness that they haven't dedicated themselves to repetition and social media postings, but they've dedicated their lives to good works. And it shows. It shows. Brothers and sisters, I'm in this with you. That we have a call in our life to demonstrate our wisdom through our conduct. Secondarily, from verse 17 and verse 18, I would encourage you to ask yourself, what does my harvest look like? Can you be candid for just a moment? Can you be open for just a moment? When you pause and evaluate the wake of your life, what do you see? May the Spirit of God give you eyes to see. Is it marked by division? 
Is the wake of your life marked by severed relationships? Is it marked by drama and discord? Or is it marked by peace, gentleness, enjoyable and healthy relationships, good fruits? When you look at the harvest of your life, when you look at the wake of your life, what do you see? You see, in this context, the Lord is convicting us that we need to be people that are reaping a harvest of peace. If I look at relational discord in the wake of my life, I have one person that needs to change, and it's me. I have to grow. If I see divisiveness in every sphere, I have to change. The Lord is prompting me to be someone who is wise and demonstrating the wisdom that he possesses that we can all find ourselves in this list somewhere, that we need to grow in being teachable, we need to grow in being gentle, that we need to grow in being, you fill in the blank. What is it that God's calling you to do to grow in an aspect of wisdom? And finally, recognize this, that Paul says in Ephesians 2.14 that Jesus is our peace that it's impossible for us to talk about peace, peace that comes in relationships, peace that comes in the wake of our lives, peace that comes in our own internal state, and not discuss Jesus. Ephesians 2.14, Paul says this, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, Ultimately, when we are wise, we are seeking to live out peace that Jesus alone can bring. That some under the sound of my voice potentially don't know the peace of Jesus. It is Jesus alone that can make you right with God the Father. It is Jesus alone that can bring you peace, that offers you relational health, personal well-being, wholeness, that Jesus is the only one that can restore you. He is the one that brings clarity and resolution and harmony. That if you don't know the peace of Jesus Christ, that may today be that day where you ask someone, hey, I'm struggling. I don't know. My life is not peaceable. That's all I know. Can you tell me about Jesus? And for those of you who are believers, you must recognize the idea that the only way that you can genuinely be wise and exude this wisdom in a peaceable life is as you know Jesus Christ, as you replicate Jesus Christ, as you image him to those that are around you. Let us be those that live out the peace of Jesus. When James stood up, to address those at the Jerusalem council. He was a man that embodied the wisdom that he would write of. He was a man whose wisdom promoted peace. And that if you recall from Acts 15, that what James said became the recommendation that would now go out to Gentile believers, newly converted believers. You know, James didn't know everything. If you read Acts 21, it was actually James's advice that got Paul arrested. <laughs> Whoops. He doesn't know everything. But he demonstrates through his conduct and his wisdom the things that he wrote of in James chapter 3. To be truly wise doesn't mean that you know everything, you've read everything, you keep up with every news media outlet. But what it does mean is that your life looks like verse 17. Verse 18, you know, it is connected to chapter 4 and verse 1. In chapter 4, verse 1, James transitioned into that hard question, and he said this. He said, where does conflicts and fighting come from? It comes from a lack of wisdom. 
It comes from setting your mind on things below. It comes from selfishness and jealousy. It comes from thinking that we are the expert and we're unwilling to demonstrate it in our conduct. That's where conflict comes from. Lighthouse, I come from Faith Community Church. This is my prayer for all of us, that we would be churches that are peaceable because we are demonstrating the wisdom of God, the only wise God, and that we would get to experience the blessedness of Matthew 5, 9, where Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. It's that Jesus that offers us peace, and it's that Jesus that makes us peacemakers. As we move to this time of communion, may we reflect on that peace that we have. And let me pray for us as we do so. Oh, Father, if there was ever a time for Christians to demonstrate wisdom, to demonstrate that we are open to reason, that we are gentle, that now is that time. I pray for Lighthouse, Lord, that this church would be a church that genuinely wants to honor you and love each other. That there would be no individual or persons that see themselves as wise and assert themselves and push themselves forward and advance themselves, but that Lighthouse would be a church that is known for its peaceableness, it's open to reason, it's gentility. May we be believers in our workplaces and in our homes and in our hobbies that are demonstrating that we are not wise in and of ourselves, but that we're wise only through the help that you give us and that you do give to us. Give us grace, Father, to be wise. Give us grace to demonstrate that wisdom, that it blesses those that are around us our neighborhoods, our employers, our employees, our families. And may we point all of the glory back to your son, Jesus. May we look to him to bring the ultimate peace that all of us long for and that no party, no dollar, no emotional state can bring to us, that it is only through your son, Jesus, and the message of the gospel that we can have peace. May we hold that confidently and excitedly on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday of this week. Thank you now, Lord. We pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen.